Good afternoon and welcome to ASAP Live. I am John Holley and I serve as pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Old Japan, New Jersey. And I'm delighted to be here with me for this study that has been a part of Prince of Peace's Christian education tradition for decades now. But this, I believe, is the first time that we are trying to conduct the study online. So I thank you for being a part of this first session. Hope that we will continue to grow in grace and deepen in faith and look for new ways to expand, ways to connect with, with you while you are at home and we shelter in place. So our topic for conversation this day is going to be Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And we're going to be spending, I believe, five sessions looking at this first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He actually wrote several letters maybe up to five letters to the Corinthians. But in our Christian New Testament, we have two major letters among the 27 books of the New Testament that are associated with St. Paul's Corinthian correspondence. So I thank you again for being here. Would you please join me in a word of prayer as we get started with our period of study this day? Let us pray. A loving and gracious Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for your church throughout the ages and all over the world. We thank you for the faithful disciples that you have risen up and continue to raise up among us to proclaim your word and to spread your love in word and deed now as well. We thank you for the church that you founded in. Greece, especially in the city-state of ancient Corinth, and for the witness of your servant, St. Paul, who worked with those leaders in that church to extend the boundaries of your community. We ask, O oh Lord, that in this time you would continue to lead and guide and inspire us by the wisdom of your holy and life-giving spirit, that you would be with us now as we study your word as given down to us through the writings of our brother, St. Paul. For all these things, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in your holy and life-giving name. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians. And the approach that I'm going to be using is, is kind of based on one of the formats put together in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's Book of Faith approach to scripture. Now we, if you've participated in ASAP in the past, you, you've known something of these Book of Faith studies and the direction that they take and the format that is presented, that in the Book of Faith approach, we, we look for four primary ways of looking at scripture, of trying to get the wisdom out of scripture. And I've written them on the board here. We have a literary approach. We have an historical critical approach to a particular text, we have our Lutheran approach to whatever text ha happens to be assigned because we as Lutheran Christians certainly have our peculiar way of dealing with scripture, so therefore that is a way that we can get God's wisdom out of the inspired text. And then finally I have written on the board, can't quite see it, I'll move the podium over to the side here, this word is devotional, the devotional way of dealing with the text. It, it's kind of getting into some of this concept of Lexio Divina, the holy listening, the holy reading that we do, even perhaps in our personal daily devotions. What is the spirit of our Lord leading us individually and perhaps as a group to consider as important in a passage of scripture that is being studied? So with that in mind, we have this first theme for this week on whose am I? Whose am I? To whom do I belong? Well, we're going to try and get some answers to that question in the passage that is assigned here for today. So let's now read the passage for this day from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 30. So if you have it at home, please feel free to follow along as I read it aloud. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. St. Paul writes, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sustesines. <clears throat> Excuse me. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Galius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Well, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God in righteousness, in sanctification, and Redemption. Here ends the reading for this day. So that is the beginning of this letter of First Corinthians. Paul has his hands full to say the least with the Corinthians, the Christians there in that city state of ancient Corinth. Um, 
little bit of a background on ancient Corinth. It was at the center of the Roman province of Achaia. It was um, an area that was quite prosperous because it was basically there on an isthmus. Um, I believe that an isthmus is where you have water on two sides of land. So, and there was um, it was a narrow stretch of land. It was actually um, blocking, I guess, the Adriatic and the Aegean seas. I think maybe in future periods I'll try and put a map up here on the board so that you can see it. Or if you have a map at home or perhaps in your Bible, um, you can take a look at where Corinth is located. It's, it's again, close to the water, so that means it has access to, to all kinds of commerce that was going on throughout the Roman world of the day. Indeed, even going back to the time of Alexander the Great and, and the, uh, the prominence, prominence of Greek culture throughout the known Mediterranean world, Corinth was an important place. I have heard that Philip, who is the father of Alexander the Great, that Philip actually even tried to unite all the Greek city-states like Athens or Sparta or how many more can you name? Um, that were out there and around, and, and to get them together as one united nation, and he tried to get them all to unite in this ancient city-state of Corinth. Of Corinth. So, so it is an important place to say the least, but it is also a place that is known for, I guess, uh, not the most uh, sanctimonious living. Uh, there was a saying that, that goes, you're acting like a Corinthian. Indeed, if, if you were found or if you were heard by someone to say, you're acting like a Corinthian, that was not a, 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 um, a compliment. It's basically saying you're acting like a Neanderthal or something like that. Um, get with the program. Improve your act a little bit. Pick up the pace here and act with a little bit more virtue. So it just speaks to the fact that uh, Corinth seems to have some of the uh, implications of a, a current day um, Las Vegas, for, for that matter. So, so that's what Paul is having to deal with here. Um, it is a beautiful place. I mean, between the two seas, the Aegean and the Adriatic, um, you, would, you could imagine that it is just a gorgeous area, and, and it certainly is. So the people were just into enjoying life and, and perhaps maybe not other things that they should have been concerned about, like taking care of the poor or working for issues of peace and justice. So again, Paul has his work cut out in this ancient Greek city-state. I have heard that the Greek philosopher Diogenes, um, I think he was regarded as a skeptic. He may even have been the founder of skeptics. He was known to argue with some of the other Greek philosophers, I, I believe, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, maybe all of them. But, but whether he did argue with all of them or not, he evidently spent some time, um, I think it was at the end of his life, in Corinth, and, and he was known even to have had a confrontation with Alexander the Great. Indeed, he was, he was evidently um, laying out, enjoying the sun one day when Alexander the Great came to him and, and wanted to have a conversation with him. And basically, Diogenes said something to the effect of, could you move a little bit? You're blocking the sun. And can't you see I'm trying to sunbathe? Can you imagine? Saying that to Alexander the Great, that Diogenes, he was quite a figure indeed. In fact, it had been said that Diogenes would go through the city of Corinth in the middle of the day, maybe at 12 o'clock noon, carrying a lit lantern. And people would say something to the effect of, why are you walking around in the middle of the day in broad daylight carrying a lit lantern? Diogenes' response, because I am looking for an honest man. <laughs> All and of what Paul is having to deal with in this very rich, prosperous, diverse, but um, let's just say charitably an energetic city in the ancient world. 
So Paul apparently planted the church in Corinth very early in his ministry. Um, he, his ministry, I've heard uh, dates that it went from roughly the year 50 AD to the year 64 AD. So it's like a 14 year period that Paul is, is out and about. Um, he, he evidently wrote this letter or his letters of correspondence with the Corinthians. Um, I had read that he wrote it from Ephesus, which was across the Aegean Sea, I believe, by my geography correct over in Asia Minor, the present day country of, of Turkey. So, so he planted the church, and then as we, we heard in the reading for today from, from Chloe's people, uh, there were problems in the church that he had planted. Things were getting a little bit contentious. They were fighting, there were divisions. So Paul was trying to, to moderate, if you will, from afar by writing these letters and having these letters taken to to the group of Christians in Corinth and, and trying to get them to work out their problems. Um, the first church evidently started in Corinth as, a, as a, um, a house church, which is the way churches got their starts. I mean, they weren't, Christians weren't initially wor worshiping in the basilicas. That, for the most part, didn't take place until after Constantine made the Christian faith, the faith of the Holy Roman or the, the Roman Empire, which then became the Holy Roman Empire later on. So, so um, uh, a couple by the name of Prisca and Aquila, I think that's how you say the name, Prisca and Aquila, that they were a husband and wife team, and they were basically the uh, patriarch and matriarch of the Corinthian church, and Paul trusted them to kind of keep an eye on things, and they were sharing their house with the gathering community so that they could all worship the Lord Jesus Christ in, in their home. So that's how things were getting started initially in the church and in this church in particular in Corinth. Now, getting at some of the uh, divisions, it seems that there were important people um, that had made their way into, um, into um, Corinth. Corinth, the Corinthians seem to be very big into the um, activity of name dropping. You've heard of that today, right? Oh, I just met, I just met the president, Donald Trump. Uh -huh. You may feel pretty good about yourself if you can say that. Or I had a chance, or my grandfather or great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather was there at the Gettysburg Address when Abraham Lincoln gave his famous statement. Um, name dropping here. That went on a lot in the time of Corinth, and it went on a lot uh, even today. So that's that's kind of what was going on here, where in the reading that we just had, uh, people are saying evidently, I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Paul, or I belong to Cephas. And you can kind of get a feel why people would have been wanting to be connected to guys like um, Paul and Apollos and Cephas. And for Christ, I mean, Christ was also mentioned, and he should be the one that we're all connected to. And that's what Paul was trying to do. It's not about being baptized into Paul. It's about being baptized into Christ Jesus. He is the true leader, and we need to be aware of that, is what Paul was saying to the Christians in Corinth back then. But it's also important for us today as well. Who is our leader? We have, we have no leader but Jesus. He is the one for whom we get our orders, or from whom we get our orders, and, and our continued direction in this day and age as well. So, a little problem with my microphone here, it's getting a little bit tangled. I'm going to try to untangle it. Excuse me, here we go. Sorry about that. Paulus and Cephas, those two names that I mentioned before, they were evidently very good preachers, dynamic, charismatic from what we can pick up in other parts of Scripture. Paul was not known for his preaching. I guess he was known more for his writing. He was obviously a very intellectually capable um, scholar and theologian, uh, but he was also known for his praying. He was certainly a persistent prayer. Uh, we have that old... Um, song him there is a bomb in gilead if you cannot preach like peter and you cannot pray like paul you can still tell the love of jesus and say he died for all but there's that reference again 
to the gifts of Peter as a preacher, and Paul as a prayer. Okay. So, what we're doing here is that God is trying through Paul to even the playing field here. Lots of diversity in Corinth, lots of difference in economic um, economic um, situations. You have the very rich, the richest of the rich. You have some of the poorest of the poor. That will come out later on in some of the passages that we'll look at. But again, perhaps not much different than the ways things are here in the United States today. We've got some of the very wealthiest people in the world and also some of the very poorest. And, and God is always in the prophetic voice trying to get the richest attention that don't forget about the poor, the vulnerable, the voiceless, the marginalized. God does not forget and we should not forget either. Paul is the agent at this time trying to hold this all together. So, Going into some of the specifics of our literary approach to these verses here in the first chapter of this first letter of Corinthians. As I mentioned before, this is an ongoing dialogue that Paul is having um, with the, the church in Corinth. As I had said before, there could have been at least five letters that have been bunched together. Not all of Paul's letters evidently sur survived. Um, Wisdom is an important theme in this letter, and particularly in these first opening verses, because the, the Corinthians themselves thought that they were wise. They even called themselves, in one of the commentaries that I have read for today, they called themselves pneumotics. Pneumotics. You get that root in the Greek there, uh, pneumonia, or the, the pneuma, which means spirit. So to be called Pneumotics is basically to say that they were calling themselves spirit persons, spirit persons. And Paul himself also emphasized um, himself as a spirit person. But he also was trying to push those Corinthians, if you think that you're wise, don't think that your salvation and that the resurrection for yourselves has been fully achieved and come to its fullest expression yet. Paul was constantly pushing the Corinthians, and this is coming out throughout the dialogue um, of First and Second Corinthians, to, to live in this in-between age that is sometimes referred to as the already and the not yet. The already because, yes, Jesus has died and has been raised, and because you are baptized, you two are connected to the fruits of his resurrection, but, but the full transformation of, of your human form has not been completed yet. That is for the time to come. So in this in-between time, you need to do your best to live with the mind of Christ, humility and love, concern for God above all who leads us to concern and love for our neighbor. And this already but not yet is best symbolized in the mind of Paul through the crucified Christ. The old way of doing things in the world is coming to an end. A new way is emerging that God is bringing forth. Lutheran context here. I'd like to say that Paul's theology, according to a scholar from Germany by the name of Jürgen Becker, there are many different ways to interpret Paul's theology, but I like this Jürgen Becker approach. Um, I studied some of his work when I was in, in seminary. He basically was boiling Paul's theology down to three major areas. So I'll try and write them here on the board. Something called a theology of election. Got a little bit of this theology of election in the first few verses here from 1 Corinthians. That, that it, it speaks of, of people that are chosen. And, and for, for us as, as um, Christians, the, the visible physical sign of our 
election or chosenness would be the sacrament of, of baptism. But it, it's it's basically coming down to when you say you believe, you believe in God the Father Almighty, you believe in God the Son, Jesus Christ, you believe in the Holy Spirit, these, these confessions of faith of our creed, this, these are signs of, of one's chosenness. And it's a gift because how can you say that you believe that in Jesus you see the creator of the uh, the creator of the universe walking around in human form? I mean, from a, a logical wisdom perspective, that's that doesn't make sense. But yet when we say that we believe this, and and we do as, as followers of Jesus, as, as those who are baptized, that's a gift. Faith is a gift. And Paul would say this is just a sign of one's election. So this theology of election. Some people hear it and believe. It's like seed scattered along the path. Some of it grows. Some of it doesn't. It is part of the mystery of God. So this theology of election is a key part of understanding Paul's theology. Second key theological frame for Paul is something I'm um, this this um that's the Greek letter theta by the way it's a shorthand for theology theology of election theology of the cross that's coming forward a lot here in these first few verses the last place that you expect to find God is where often we find God and especially the God that we see as a man hanging on a tree. That is key for Paul. Would not have expected a crucified Messiah. That, I mean, think about it. A crucified Messiah. That's an oxymoron in most instances. But that is precisely what we get in the revelation of God through Jesus Christ. And that was central for Paul. Trying to shake up these Corinthians who, who were into all this posh living and what's the latest wisdom and what's the latest style? Um, he, he wanted to, to ground them in this wisdom of the cross. The old order is falling away. A new order is, emer is emerging. We're the last place that you would expect to find God among the poor, the destitute, the marginalized, the vulnerable. That's where God has solidarity. That is where God makes his most profound revelations in love. And then finally, a, a uh, concept that for Lutheran Christians, I think it's pretty familiar. Justification by grace through faith. This really comes comes out in Paul's uh, letters to the Romans, um, which were um, documents or a document that was written after his Corinthian correspondence was complete. Um, it was part of his ongoing revelation through the, the work of the Holy Spirit in his life, coming to some understanding about how this Jesus experience was playing out for him and for the community that he had been entrusted with. Again, it is a gift that we are elected, it is a gift that we can understand that Jesus is present most personally and powerfully in, in the events of the cross. And then through this connection to the crucified and risen one, we are made right by God. Our sins are washed away, if you will. Because we are baptized, and when we accept that as the extraordinary work of God through ordinary means, we are put right or justified by faith. All is a gift. All has grace. So, keeping those three concepts in mind, um, it is, I, I found it to be incredibly important, important in trying to understand and and hold together this mind of Paul in his various correspondence with the communities that he either established or had regular correspondence with throughout the Mediterranean world. So, if we were going to be asking ourselves, uh, where is God present today? 
especially under this understanding of theology of the cross, which is one of the key concepts in our first 30 verses from 1 Corinthians. Where would we do our applied theology to find God present today under a theology of the cross? That is, where would we least expect to find God today? I think a lot of it's been coming out because of this global pandemic, that, that people that have been pushed to the margins like, you know, or overlooked in the past, like truck drivers or, or janitors or garbage collectors, um, people, people that have been undervalued and overlooked, now you can see how important they are and how valuable they are. Meat packers, for example. And how vulnerable they are, too, that in these places, under this concept of theology of the cross, the last places, perhaps, that we would look to see God's presence, God is, God is present there. And it also unites us with their concern that if they are sick, we need to be concerned about it, that we are united as one human community. Theology of the cross helps us to focus in this way. Where have you been surprised to see God of light? Have you seen any Christ sightings, or are there any Christ sightings that you can identify? I'm, I'm going to try to do one here and talk about it again. I, I talked about it a few weeks ago as well in a, in a sermon. Let's see if I can get this up. Christ sightings place where we would not necessarily expect to see God, but under this theology of the cross, we wouldn't have expected to see Jesus crucified, but that's what happened, and that's where God's most profound love was revealed. So, too, that we're looking for ways that we wouldn't expect to see God today, but where God's love continues to be surprisingly revealed. Let's so get this to work here. Ah, there we go. So I don't know if you uh, have seen this picture before. I had mentioned that a few weeks ago. Um, I, I talked about Christ's sightings and and um, the X-ray vision of the gospel, trying to to find places where God is at work in the world today. And and what what you see there is a picture of that Chinese doctor who who had contracted the coronavirus early on in the global pandemic. And, and he knew that something was up. He wanted to get the word out. He wanted to be, um, I, I guess, basically uh, an early warning that we need to do something. We need to act in order to save lives. In his face, I see the face of Christ again. Maybe the last place that we would expect to see Christ, but yet through his action, through his concern for others, there is an expression of the crucified Christ trying to bring forth life in a way that maybe we would not have necessarily expected. One more picture to share today. Reading an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few weeks ago, and I happened to come across an article about this gentleman. This gentleman was a healthcare worker who worked with aged dying patients in a nursing home aged dying patients that were dying of unfortunately the coronavirus but yet at great sacrifice to himself he stayed with them he comforted them he helped them he served them and he himself contracted the virus and died there in his expression in his face i see the eyes of christ again Perhaps, again, a place where we would not necessarily expect to find Christ, but where, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God shows up. God shows up when we most need him. Okay.
So think about it. Pray about it. Where are those places where you are surprised to find Jesus in your own life and in the world today? When you're when you're listening to the news on TV or when you're reading a, a paper or when you're reading the news online, are we, are we able to read it with um, devotional eyes as well? I mean, we, we get so much bad news these days, don't we? Lots of bad news. But I think that in between the cracks, there can be a lot of good news. Good news of a great God working overtime to help us in these very challenging situations in the world. So, remember your baptism. This is getting to some of the devotional components. We're saying that there are, there are strange ways that God appears in our lives, that there are places where God, we wouldn't expect God to show up, but yet, lo and behold, God shows up doing extraordinary things in, in ordinary ways through water and God's word, are the ways that we can continue to remember our baptism, that Christ is with us, that nothing can separate us from God's love. And then with this, this um, gift of faith, the x-ray vision of the gospel, go out into the world and try and find some places where we see God at work surprising us in wonderful ways. In, in service and kindness to others and in, in love that is expressed and shared. You know that, that statement, you heard that statement about uh, I've got to see it to believe it. You've seen that right? Or you've heard that right? When we're talking about faith, it is an issue where we say not I've got to see it to believe it, but I've got to believe it to see it. So we, we go to the nightly news or we read the paper and, and we, we kind of almost get connected in a, in a prayerful way, a contemplative way. Okay, Jesus, what are you up to in the events that I'm hearing about right now? And let God's Holy Spirit lead you and see where he takes you. Christ sightings, Christ sightings. Marvelous ways that God continues to sustain us in faith, bring us together as one. Paul was trying to do that with all the divisions that were going on in ancient Corinth. God was trying to do that through Paul. God, I believe, is trying to continue to bring us together and unite us in the midst of conflict and challenge this day as well. So that's about all that I had to say. I think I probably said enough for these first few verses in 1 Corinthians about the division that's going on, but again, about the way that God is working to bridge that division through the work of Paul, pointing to the cross, the last place that we would expect God to show up, but the very place that God chooses to thwart the wisdom of the world and bring forth a holy wisdom that is beyond human intellect to fully comprehend. But it, when it is believed, there is grace. And we know that God is truly at work. So sisters and brothers in Christ, friends in faith, I'd like to thank you for joining me for this time together today. If you can join me for future sessions as we take a look at this powerful set of letters that our brother in Christ, St. Paul, has given to us as a living legacy of our Christian faith. Till we meet again, please be safe, stay well, and God's peace be with you now and always.